But the one I got for specific purposes, you can actually get like a rechargeable one and many different types. But I got like where I have to get this replaced every three to five years. But the reason that's really good is because instead of having the recording saved for my brain, so that's the other thing. This device measures my brain activity. This is always recording my brain. And so stuff can be uploaded to a cloud. With the rechargeable ones, I, they don't have it yet where you can upload it to the, it to the cloud. It still records it, but instead of like me waiting every month or every six months to go to the doctor and then they take the charts out or the readings, it will be, it's just sent to a wow. secure location. They can virtually monitor your brain activity from afar. Wow. Welcome to The Uptick. Brought to you by the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, empowering children and adults through education, advocacy, and research by sharing the stories and experiences relevant to the TS community. All right. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today. I am here with Callum. Callum, how's your day going so far? Pretty good. It's been a nice and relaxing day right before the holidays. Cool, cool. We are here to talk about a recent treatment that you had for your Tourette syndrome, deep brain stimulation. If you could just describe the experience of, of DBS in, in one word, what would you say? Amazing. That's awesome. Talk to me about that. Elaborate on it. Why? What made it so amazing? So I feel like a misconception I get a lot is that people go into the DBS thing and it's a cure. It's not, but it is a treatment. And I feel like what I've gotten is I've lessened my tics a lot less. I still have my really complex tics, but instead of there being over a hundred of them a day, maybe like 10 a day, the reason I got DBS was actually because of like myself punching or like head banging tics. So that was actually the reason. So I don't mind the complex tics. It can just get a little annoying. But besides that, yeah, I just feel a lot better. I'm not as like achy all the time. Like my fist doesn't hurt or my head, I don't have as many headaches because I'm not hitting my head. So um, it's giving me pretty much that part of my life back where I don't feel the best thing. Like I feel a lot better. I wasn't feeling the best. I had headaches. I was very achy. I bet many people could relate to that. And it just gave me so much more control over my tics too. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know how to dis describe the feeling. It's just amazing because I can still have premonitory urges for my tics sometimes, but it really just works well. I'm able to block them out without having any problems. And the skills that I work Learn through like through uh, CBIT, which is the intervention therapy. If you use those tools and I put those together and it's really helped with my tics. That's incredible. I'm so glad to hear that. I'd love to talk a little bit about what DBS is for anyone that isn't aware. My understanding of it is DBS is a, a brain surgery that can be done for uh, certain people with Tourette syndrome that it was done in the past a lot with Parkinson's patients and now is being used for Tourette, that it is used with people who have exhausted all the other treatment options and also have a case of TS that is really complex and impacts major life functions. You know, like you mentioned, the, the self-injuring ticks that can make you a candidate for that. I'm wondering if you can walk me through what the lead up to getting DBS was like. Maybe like it did, were there, did you have to try a bunch of medicines? Did they have you try a bunch of therapies? Like talk to me about what made you a candidate for it. Okay. So yes, there is like quite a lengthy process. Luckily I got it done within about four to six months. So I was really happy about that, but it can take some people years. So I went to the Mount Sinai neuromodulation department and that's my team. So it was when you go for the surgery, you'll most likely have a team. So everybody in this department, all the doctors from the psychologist, psychiatrist to the neurologist who didn't does my programming, they all work in the same department and they all specialize from in the same thing, like OCD, Tourette's, as well as like Parkinson's and other movement disorders. So it's nice that you have a team and they communicate with each other, especially at the same hospital. So you usually have to go to a lot of doctor's appointments. So you have to go see the psychologist, the psychiatrist, and then a neuropsychiatrist. And that is like your cognitive testing. So it'd be like, read something back to me backwards. Or, you know, you probably had it done in school if, um, at some point. So it was that kind of testing. And of course, I went and saw my neurologist so many times, Dr. Shahed. She was really wonderful. I still see her about every month because I still have to get my device program. It was nice to have it in one place. I'm happy I didn't have to, you know, every time I went in for a visit, all like it's on the same floor, the same building and the same department. There's only like one doctor. I had to go to another department, but it's the same hospital. So it was long experience. And to be honest, if you can get through it, it's really worth it. I would honestly say a lot of the pain comes from would have to come from the medicine. So you do have to try, I believe, from every major category. I already tried many medications. I'm not going to say as many as like other people because I know people have tried like 36. I tried like 12. I'm actually still on a tick medication to help, but I also have really bad sleep problems with that. But besides like the other things, I had to try um, a Topamax. I think that's what it is. I tried Topamax last spring around this time of year. I had to try um, ORAP. So I've tried a couple of medications. 
all those heavy hitter ones I always found either had those side effects just were so much worse than a tick. So they do want to try at least like everything because it really is supposed to be like the last resort. So yeah, so you will have to try medications. You have to go to a lot of doctor's appointments. And there's other things that you just have to follow. You have to qualify for. When you get to surgery, one of the things I thought, you know, was kind of a struggle was there was actually this mental health aspect. So you couldn't, you couldn't have like any like of the tough thoughts that I'm pretty sure most people with Tourette's have had before. I would say before the surgery, I got into a really positive mindset. I was really good for six months and it was kind of tiring to uh, be that happy all the time. But I always calmed down. I like I didn't let my thoughts or my obsessions like get over me because that could inhibit me from getting the surgery. One of the things is you couldn't have had a thought or thought about something and then had it you, the surgery within six months. Really? I did not know that. So they really want you to have a positive mental attitude going into this and leading up to it. Uh, do we just, we have better outcomes with that? Or is there, did they give you a reason for, for why that's the, the way we handle it? I never really understood why that specifically, like the testing. I know if like, it's really just, but that's for like Parkinson's when you do like the neuropsych testing. So it's just to make sure you don't have any cognitive deficits. But if you do have a cognitive deficit, even if you have Parkinson's and you have one or Tourette's, doesn't matter the disorder, you, the surgery, you don't qualify for it if you have any cognitive deficits. So that's something I thought was pretty interesting. And I forget why about that. But another thing about having this and during the program, and since I'm in the early stages, they want you to keep that as you go on because they don't want your, the, really, it's really interesting on how they described it. I did a lot more research on it, but your mental health and how like you handle stressful situations we know all know stress has like multiple different side effects on our body like hair loss and like just like upset stomach or headaches just like the effects so my brain and my body is learning to work with the device so the early stages you want to keep it like keep everything normal you don't want to like cause any too much stress or anything so they really the being positive and not letting things get to you easily it's you know you just don't want to be stressed during the early stages I see. No, that makes sense. Uh, so let, let's talk a little bit about the surgery itself and the, the day of the operation. They actually put a physical device. What is it inside your head and your brain? Like, talk to me about that. So, yeah, so it's a pacemaker. It, I can't keep mine on my right, left. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a big block in my chest and I have a scar like right here. So there's my scar. So that's where they put that in. That was actually the easiest part of the surgery. So what they did is Mine was actually the first one at Mount Sinai. They used, it was an MRI guided one. So usually if I got it the traditional way, I might've had to been woken up during this procedure, which would have been a little scary, but I'm happy that I was able to have it then the MRI way. It's like a special MRI. There's this guy from the company that owns the MRI there just to make sure nothing went wrong. So yeah, they were taking multiple pictures and the doctor, the surgeon actually got, who's amazing. He actually usually uses this MRI. That's like his main tool. And he thinks it's like the future. So it made it a lot easier. They have, they put like a helmet on your head and it's like a contraption and it sticks out in the back and you drill into the head and you like, it's like a little feeder. And you, like you put the wire through the feeder and then they thread it through. They take a couple of pictures and then they were like, huh, we have to go this way. So when they moved it, it would just be about a millimeter or two. So they move it a millimeter at a time to make sure it's going the right place and not into the wrong spot. So they put it actually in mine and my thalamus. So that part of the brain is supposed to be one of the main areas to help with the ticks. So it runs up the side of my neck, goes behind my ear, and then can't really feel it up here, but I have a couple scars because they had to drill like four holes in here. And then I also have a programming device I should have brought out with me, but it's a, pretty much like an A10. It's like an old Samsung phone. I have like this clicker. It, it looks like just a power button for a TV, but like the old one where it was literally just switch the channel and turn on the TV. So it really has that one function or like if you have like, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, like an air conditioner and you get the little like simple, really simple controls. The thing is that you have that, the white thing and the white thing, that's the clicker that connects to the device in my chest. So the device in my chest, you can, there's a couple of different versions of them. But the one I got for specific purposes, you can actually get like a rechargeable one and many different types. But I got like where I have to get this replaced every three to five years. But the reason that's really good is because instead of having the recording saved for my brain. So that's the other thing. This device measures my brain activity. This is always recording my brain. And so stuff can be uploaded to a cloud. With the rechargeable ones, I, they don't have it yet where you can upload it to the it, to the cloud. It still records it, but instead of like me waiting every month or every six months to go to the doctor and then they take the charts out or the readings, it will be it's just sent to a wow. secure location. They can virtually monitor your brain activity uh, from afar. Wow. 
Now, do you get any readings? Like, are, are you able to make any adjustments yourself using this device? Like, if you're having a day where you're very stressed and you're getting a lot of those premonitory urges or you feel your tics are worse, are you able to, like, control it somehow through the device or is that not how it works? It doesn't record all the time, but it's like a, every, like, day I record it for, like, 10 minutes, the brain stuff. But besides, besides that, it's... I can change it. It's pretty much the electricity is still shocking, so it's recording and it sends electricity to the thalamus. I can change it, but I've talked to my neurologist and she's like, please don't mess with it or anything. And I met another person with the DBS before I got it and they were like, oh, I have like four different settings. But he had already had it for five to like six years. He had already gone to the doctors over it like 20 times and gotten the programming. Unless like I'm like, I'm having a really bad tick day, which I haven't had in a long time. And my mom like messages the doctor through the portal or text them, and she could say, put it up by this many voltages. I don't touch it, but yes, I can adjust, and she usually adjusts it when I go in. Now, when it comes time to get a new device in a few years, do they have to, is that another surgery, or what does that part look like, the follow-up, when you need that? The wires are just, like, permanently there. They're not coming out. Um, I don't know what they're made out of, like, vibranium or something, but they're just meant to last forever. And this will be taken out, so they'll just cut that open, take it out, connect the wires to a new one, and then I go on my way. So instead of being a brain surgery, I only just had to have the brain surgery once. So instead of having to spend like two days in the hospital when I'm done, it's literally, it's a one day surgery. So I go in and I'll be able to leave like right after because it's such my new surgery. And when you got the first surgery, then you, you said you were asleep for that, right? Yeah, that's for sure that I got it. Interesting. I uh, didn't know that that's something they could do with you being asleep. So the thing actually about my surgery is usually they do the surgeries on separate days, but my neurosurgeon was kind of like, nah, we're just going to get it done in one, which is like, I don't know how many other people have just had both surgeries done in the same day. So usually like you get the brain and then like go rest for a couple of weeks and then they plug the battery in. But he just did all of that at once. So... I didn't have to go back two separate times, which I really enjoyed. So I made the recovery process a lot shorter then. Did you get a feel for how many other people with Tourette have had DBS? It's definitely not even a super common thing in the TS community. But yeah, there's a few people. Like the one guy from around where I live, he's like 28 now. That's the person I met with DBS. But as far as I know, he's the only other person for Tourette's to have DBS in the area. It can be pretty rare, but if you usually go to a big like TAA like meeting or something like that, or like Washington or the TikCon, you usually do see a couple other people be like, oh yeah, I have DBS just because there's so many people. There's usually about four or five. Wow. Wow. So I want to talk about the fun part now, which is the results, what you've seen, how your life has been since then. You'd mentioned that this is not a cure for Tourette, that you do still have your tics. I, and I want our listeners to know, I mean, I, I have known you for a couple of years now, and I, I first met you at the Tim Howard Leadership Academy at, at the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome. And I got to say, I am noticing a night and day difference just in the in your presentation of, of your Tourette here. I mean, you are going from being interrupted in your own mid-sentence by your tics. And now just here and there, you've got some tics. And I, and I don't want to minimize the, the very real stress that, that your Tourette may still be causing you. But I just want to say I have seen a, a very noticeable improvement. Now, would you say that you've seen an improvement in both motor and vocal tics? Yeah, I would just say overall. I would say it's like 70% of my daily motor tics. And to be honest, besides my punching and my head banging, I don't really have that many motor tics besides like a neck twitch or like clicking my or cracking my fingers. They were always very simple. I never had like a jumping tick or anything like that. Really decreased, especially like I said, the self-injurious ticks or the self-harm ticks. They just decreased so much. It's been like four days the last time since I punched myself. And when I punch myself, it's not as hard as it used to be. I'm able to control it more. So it's kind of just like a little like that and it doesn't hurt. And it it really is just amazing. The vocal ticks, I still have a lot of complex vocal ticks. I still do have my coprolalia. But again, that wasn't my main worry. The main worry was the self injurious I can live with my coprolalia and my paleoaculia, all that stuff. Wow. Okay. When you think about your life before you got DBS and how it compares to your life now, I would love to hear about how things are different, how you are, you know, maybe there's things now that you could do that you couldn't do before, or how it's changed in terms of like all the different places you can go, the things you can do, the less of a burden that Tourette now is in your life. Um, so yeah, it has really allowed me. So like I said before, the process of getting back into normal things, because I've also been out of school for a while, I was online and now I'm like a teacher's coming to my house and giving me the work and instruction just to not have that stress of being in the classroom. But besides that, I can go to work. I don't, when I go to work, I don't have customers staring at me the whole time. 
It doesn't interfere with my work. Like the two weeks ago I went and it was the most ticks I had at work since the surgery. And it was just like this. I kept like my shoulder just kept rolling and my eyes just kept blinking. So I was just like, hey, I don't really feel comfortable. And my body's just like, oh, you don't have to stand at the front of the store. Just go to the back. But it really has helped with work, being with friends. It really has improved my, uh, it really improved my sports. It really improved my like sports activity. I'm able to keep my cool a lot easier. My takes don't start flailing out. When I play soccer, it's a constant moving sport, so I'm not really taking that much. But my favorite sport and my main sport I play that I'm like pretty decent at is tennis. Tennis, you have the like little breaks between serves and like rallies. But yeah, so I have that in my rallies. But when I'm ready to get in between and I'm like have that 20 to 30 seconds where I'm about to serve, not even 30, like sometimes just 15. When I'm about to serve, it can that's a second for me to like relax, so I'm not constantly moving. And then my ticks come out and the more anxious I get, my ticks aren't there as much as they used to. Like last year, I went through a couple tennis rackets because I had a banging tick with my tennis racket, destroyed a couple of them. So now I'm already like over halfway through the season and not like one tennis racket. I haven't had one tick where I slam it or anything. So it's really helped me. You could save a lot of money there. That's great. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, do you go to the movie theater ever? So that's like one of the places even before my DBS, I would always go to the movies. I actually, I have a pass. Like there's AMC, Regal. We have a Regal by me. And my dad and I would pay like the money a month and you get to go see as many movies as you want. I've had that since even before I was diagnosed with Tourette's. There used to be another service called like Movie Pass where you pay like 10 bucks a month and got to see as many as you wanted. So yeah, so I have just gone for a long time. I've had to leave one or once or twice because of my tics. Movies have always been a safe haven for me. And the wonderful part about it is that they know me so much at the movies. I've gone to the movies probably three times in the past two weeks. Yeah, so like they know who I am. Like when I walk in, they know what I want, like a soda and a small popcorn and this and that. So the workers are the workers are very understanding. And actually, even the one manager who works there, he used to be my doubles teammate for tennis on my school tennis team. So he let them know. And I've never been kicked out or asked to leave, luckily. I've never been asked to leave the movie theater. And I really consider that a safe haven. And it still has made the movie watching experience a lot better. So I really appreciate that it has made that better. So I'm not constantly like worrying about like missing the movie. I'm just able to focus. If I'm very focused, my I would honestly say I have more motor tics than I do vocal tics. And I prefer to just have, at that point, if I'm watching a movie, have a lot more like motor tics. And the motor tics are very really, like small, like me blinking like this with my one eye. And I have like a toe clicking tic. It's, I've had it since I was like five. It was like one of my first tics or even longer. But like my toes like flick off each other. Like, oh, it's actually happening now because I'm talking about it. But that's like my main tic now. It's like my the most tic, common tic I have. But it makes very minimal sound unless you're in a quiet room with another person, you're sitting by the person, that's the only time you hear the clicking. But if I'm at the movies or even at like a restaurant, you're not going to hear my toes click. What effect did deep brain stimulation have on the self-injurious ticks? That was the biggest, in my opinion, the biggest difference. My vocal ticks are pretty bad. I definitely meet people who do have them a lot worse than I did or do. They weren't as constant. They were a lot more complex. And when they did happen, there was just a lot of them. And then I could go like 10 minutes without one. But um, 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 I was able to. Well, we're talking about Tourette, so I mean, that's to be expected. I, uh, <laughs> um, you know, anytime we we're around each other, I mean, you're seeing me tick right now too, and I'm and I'm I'm getting triggered by your ticks. You're you're <laughs> ticking more because you see mine, and it's just a it's a whole thing. But um, no, what were you saying though? But yeah, the self injurious ticks have just been so much less, especially the head banging one has pretty much vanished just in the thin air at this point really just the punching just the punching myself so yeah so in that aspect it really i would say they decreased by 99.9 percent .9%. once a week i'll punch myself but the amount of time that takes up it's less than one percent of your week yeah and it sounds like you said for the most part even the punching tick now it's a lot more mild and it's not as uh aggressive of a punch so i mean that's incredible that uh that this this surgery was able to to address the ticks that we'd want it to most, you know, the ones that can actually, that, that can do significant damage to your body. Those were the ticks that we were able to target and get reduced by this substantially. So that's really incredible. What was something that surprised you about DBS that maybe you didn't expect or, or know going into it? So the biggest thing is I've always had pretty bad handwriting and it still shakes a little bit like, but my hands, when I used to hold them out like flat like this, they used to be like this. 
But now when they first turn the device on, like I saw the device in me and the, the implants, they actually wait a couple of weeks after to activate it. But like when they first turn it on, if you've ever seen the interview on CBS, it was like they show it and it's like a snap. And then my hands stop going from this. And then like my other hand would be shaking and they would turn on one side. And my other hand would just be like this. That was a really nice side effect. I really, yeah, I'm a lot like yeah. less like a skitsy when I'm like writing or anything like that. Or like, I don't accidentally mistype stuff. I had like pretty much a minor like tremor or shake and that's pretty much like gone now. I still have a little bit, but not as bad as it was. Wow. That's incredible. Have you noticed any other benefits aside from Tourette's that uh, we attribute to the DBS? I would definitely say you're just a lot happier. I still get like sad and stuff, but at first when it really, when you turn it on, I don't know if it's like a placebo effect, but when you like up it or the energy, you just become so much more aware, still just feel better as a person. You feel a lot more positive. Like, again, I don't know if that's like a true side effect. It really, the main thing was the Tourette's. So that's like the main thing that helped. I've actually still had my struggles with OCD and stuff like that, anxiety. So that is still there, sadly, did not really help that. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. If you got any benefit to the comorbidities, it, it doesn't sound like it. I mean, that's not what it's made for, but it'd be nice if it helped those things too in some way. So yeah, I wanted to say it wouldn't didn't completely happen because I was always so aware because of how much I was taking. So I would say it brought my anxiety down so much to that point, at least my social anxiety, where I thought I was being judged all the time, which is like a huge part of my anxiety. But yeah, I still have like my OCD. And I honestly say I like my teoretic OCD, like my where you can barely distinguish if it's a tick or OCD or compulsion, those are pretty, I don't have any teoretic OCD symptoms. So that's been really nice too. Yeah. Wow. That is great. Is there anything you can't do because of the, the device that's in you? I mean, going scuba diving or going on a roller coaster, or going swimming, or, that's all fair game? The surgeon said, don't play American football. Like that's like out. So like no box. <laughs> yeah. Like don't box anyone. Like don't get into like MMA or like a fight. That's sport. dangerous for everybody. But like yeah. tennis, I can even go play basketball, tennis, run, play soccer. Even though that's so physical, it's not as like physical as the other sports. So I can still do that stuff. Swimming. I've heard a lot of stories about like how it's affected some people swimming. So I'm not really sure yet. But they do recommend you have someone. So whenever I go swimming, I'll have to have like a friend or just someone nearby who can like pull me out. And it, as far as I can tell, it doesn't like really disable you from swimming. It just makes it a lot harder. So you're like, hey, I just need a hand and someone can like come over and you're still kicking and be afloat. But the other thing that I was told not to do, I'm not really sure why, is that I cannot arc weld. I think that's what it is. I cannot like weld or do arc welding. That has something to do with the advice, hmm. the device. And then I also cannot go through metal detectors anymore. If I ever go to like the, air, the airport, even when I was in Washington, I had a card. I have a card with me that tells them. And they were like, okay, we'll just do like a wand. So it's not the big magnetic effect, like the one in Washington. So I was like walking through the machine and just walk through and wow. I got to go around it. So they're just, and it's not even that it's going to like damage necessary the device. They just said it can turn it off. Might like trigger oh. it to drop. So that's like the big deal. Why? They, so yeah, so I can't go through like big metal detectors at no airport or like a government building. What about MRIs now? Because you do have like, actually, I don't know. Is it a me metal that's in your body? But can you still get an MRI scan? I'm not really sure about that, actually. I don't think I can. I think I, like that MRI I was talking about, like where the doctor to see my brain, I think I'd have to go to like a bigger hospital. So where I live in like Scranton, there's like no big hospitals besides New York and Philadelphia. And I'm located like right in the middle of the two. So I have to drive two hours to use the special MRI machines. There's no, sadly no hospitals, but that's not even that big of a deal. Cause I feel like with anything medical, if I have to get an MRI, I'm probably going to be doing it at a bigger hospital instead of something place local. Yeah. So I have that. I'm just, I'm pretty sure I can't, I might be able to, I should probably ask my doctor that though. Talk to me about your future plans. Are you thinking college? You want to keep working? How much longer in school do you have? I've always been ranked top 10 in my class this year. My grades kind of fell into the 80s and it was like kind of rough for me because I was at home so much. And I don't know if you know this, but chem learning chemistry through a computer screen is not the best way to learn chemistry. Yeah. I was getting the definitions. I didn't get to do any labs. Besides that, my big thing is that my majors that I want to go into for college, I do want to go to college eventually. I hope to go after my senior year. I want to major in either history, political science, or nursing. Nice. Are you in your junior year right now? Yeah, I'm in my junior year, wrapping it up in the next two months. Any thoughts about what kind of career you want? I mean, you got a few years ahead of you to be planning this out, but any thoughts on it right now? So I think that nursing is kind of self-explanatory with that major. But what I want to do is like a history major or a political science is I'd want to go to law school. 
I don't have to become a lawyer, but that law degree can help. And I don't know if that's like a thing, but like a disability advocate lawyer. Oh, absolutely. There's tons of work from nonprofits to lobbying to even within organizations, being a representative and advocate for people with disabilities and other conditions. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot you can do with that. That's really exciting to hear. Talk to me a little bit about uh, CBED. I know you mentioned that earlier on is something that you're also working with to manage the ticks. I know that's one of the first line treatments now, uh, at least as far as therapies are concerned for, for TS. It sounds like you've had some success with that. So yeah, I've actually, I'm pretty much done with CBIT. I still have it if I need a blocker because that's like the whole thing is about developing natural blockers without causing when you hold your ticks in. They don't really want you to mentally hold your ticks in. The breathing, it's a lot harder to block them. So when I first found CBIT, I've actually seen my doctor coming up about three years now, two and a half, two to three years. So when I, my first like four months were like hardcore, like, yeah, I have this tick. I have a new tick. This is my most common tick. How do I focus on that and the CBIT is really, you can go to it as long as you want, especially with new takes. But really, the CBIT therapy is you're actually being trained to like do CBIT yourself. So you're pretty much a professional at CBIT. It's like a class you take like every week. And they're teaching you the tools that you need to build the blockers. So instead of having to go to like, if you instead of going to CBIT every week, because now I go to like CBT, which is the more like OCD and anxiety. And that's what I mainly do with my, ther- my therapist. But he also specializes in CBIT. I was able to focus on all of those tools and I would say it helped my motor tick so much when I got this bit. When it comes to vocal ticks, you have to really do like a lot of breathing and that's like the main thing is so like if I was clasping my hand, I would take my knee and I would like grab my knee like this. So like like this hands my knee. And then you're supposed to like squeeze on your knee. And this is your competing response, yeah, right? Yeah, it's the competing response. So that's what I have. And like, if my neck twitches, I just flex my traps. Actually. You don't want to be like shaking so because you're like so intense, but you really do want to tense up your neck. And then it really stopped a lot of my motor tics. Well, now it sounds like as part of it was you learned how to do CBIT for yourself. So if you get new tics, are you able to come up with a competing response for those? So that's another thing. And what I like about still seeing my therapist is if I need to, if I have like a new tick and I'm like, it's kind of annoying, especially if it's a motor tick, I will go and talk to my doctor and I'll be like, hey, I tried out this blocker. It works really well, but like stops me from doing certain actions. Like if my hand was flailing in the air, my I came up with my own competing response where it didn't cause my ticks to get worse. So I just like put my hand underneath my like set right on top of my hand. But, and it was so common in my like right side of my hand, which is like my writing hand, which is why I also have like a scribe if I need one in school or even my typing hand. So I would use that and it would just get in the way. So instead it's, they help you find what's optimal. So you're not stopping. It's really about building a faster way to physically stop the tick from happening. You can come up with great blockers that still work and that you can still use them. So the thing is with some of the more optimal blockers, it's more about like mental stuff where you have to like keep your arm flailing. You like tense up your arm up here, try to keep it like straight down at your side. So that also works. So I always usually have a couple of blockers, especially like for neck, like for hand flailing like that, where my hand goes up in the air. If I'm at home watching TV, I'll just sit on my hands to stop it. It doesn't make my ticks worse or anything. I do that too. Yeah. yeah. So I'll do that. But besides that, if I'm like writing or I'm in the middle of working, it just takes a lot of mental focus to flex the muscles and try to keep doing it or do the movement to stop it, like grabbing something real quick for like 30 seconds to stop it. And one of the ways like, is there'd be like a table. So I'd, there's a table, put your hand flat out on the table, press it down. And then well, that takes less time and you don't have to like worry about it. It's more efficient at stopping it, but you really have to tense up your hand when you're doing that blocker. So it really stops. You sound so knowledgeable in this. I feel like you could teach a class on how to develop these blockers and with like so many examples you could give to people. How were you able to find a therapist that specializes or at least was knowledgeable in, in CBIT for TS specifically? That was a little bit of a, it's definitely a struggle, especially when you live in a small town in the middle of nowhere in the New York City, like Philadelphia or New York is two hours or when you don't have those opportunities. Telehealth has been, especially for like Tourette related things, has been like a wonderful thing. I've gone to this doctor for three years. I've never seen this doctor in person. I've only met with him via via computer. People are like, oh, I want to go to a local CBIT therapist. It is really hard to find one. And to be honest, the best place to look for them is TAA or NJCTS usually knows so many doctors and they'll help you find a doctor. So it's like really nice. It's how I found my doctor was through that. So that's really helped with me finding a doctor. 
That's awesome. I grew up in a small town in Indiana and I didn't know anyone. This was years ago and they didn't have all the resources we had today. So I was seeing a social worker and he actually went out and bought a book on CBIT for Tourette's and tried to teach himself. And to his credit, you know, he, he tried and we, and we tried. I ended up not going the full three months. You know, it takes a lot of time and energy and commitment to, to do CBIT right. One of the things we're doing with this podcast is to shed light on the experiences of adults with Tourette syndrome. That's one big part of it. It's also just around bringing more awareness to Tourette's in general. What is one piece of advice that you would give to other people with Tourette syndrome? You have your rough times, but eventually there will be a better time. You really have to go out there to find certain things, reach out to specialists, even if you can't like go to them, ask, do you know any doctors in this area? It's really about reaching out into the community because I've met other people with Tourette's and then they're like, oh, what's the TAA? What's the NJCTS? I didn't even know there was a Tourette chapter or anything in my state. I didn't even know there was a Tourette foundation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Especially to the people watching this who have probably been in the Tourette community. That's like a big thing that you definitely got right is sticking into the Tourette community, reaching out, Talking to other people, that's another thing. I feel like Tourette's is very like singular and anecdotal in a sense where if you reach out online and talk to other people, it's it, you can find ways people are like, oh, I had this tick, but this is what I did to stop it. And it really helped. And it's like a very similar tick. You can go on like any Facebook group or online or any support group and people will be like, oh yeah, my kid has that or I have that. How do you help with it? You're not a medical provider, but you have the experience. You're pretty much a pro at having threats. Just don't be afraid to ask for help. It's great advice. And also, I mean, the threat community can be a good source for friendships. I've m met a lot of incredible people through these organizations and meeting other people that are going through similar challenges. It's it can be really rewarding. One other question we probably should have put in an earlier section. I'm curious about, have you found that you have less of a need for accommodations now that you've gone through DBS? I would say yes, especially like in daily life where I don't need accommodations from like a public place or anything like that. That was the whole thing with the process is if you have DBS, at least where I had it, the team is like, they really want to ease you back into life after the surgery because it's still a big procedure. <laughs> yeah, They really wait. They don't want you to walk straight back into work. You know, I started out, it was baby steps because my anxiety was so bad to go back into the school. So it started out, the teacher came, I re-enrolled back at my school from like an online char charter. So I went back to my school, I'm on homebound. So the teacher brings me work. I'd rather be learning in school, doing the work in there. So I'm not learning as much. So my junior year will look a little weaker on my transcript, but for my health, it has just been so important to ease your way back into it. You don't want to backtrack yourself. You don't want to, so like I have a very bad schedule. Like I wake up very late, do all that stuff. So it, building a schedule back, just putting the time in to actually sit down and do like three to four hours of schoolwork a day and doing that, meeting with the teacher. Like I said, I still play tennis. So putting that work in is definitely a big thing. And my accommodations for school have pretty much stayed the same. I still have my IEP meetings I have to go to. The goal is to limit how much I'm using these accommodations. So not going to, even like I said, walk before. I don't walk as much. I would. Li I used to just be like scared out and I would just go immediately in my special ed classroom, but limiting the accommodations to the point where when I go back, I'm not going to my special ed classroom besides the period where, of course, I have the class. Right, right. But instead going for that short walk, going to get a drink and having shorter time to recover essentially because of the DBS because I have more control. That's huge. That's so amazing to hear. You've got a wonderful story, Callum, and I really enjoyed talking to you about it here. Thanks so much for, for being on the, the podcast. Will I get to see you at this year's Tim Howard Academy? Yes, I will apply. I actually have the shirt on right now. So, Oh, I, well, I love that. I hadn't even noticed. I, I have to send in my application as well to be a coach. Yeah, for anyone listening, Tim Howard Leadership Academy, great opportunity for high school students with TS. And also, if you are in your 20s and 30s and want to be a coach, that's also an option too. It's about a three or four day event at Rutgers. And Kellen and I have both done it. Really incredible chance to meet people and, and become young leaders with TS. Well, thanks so much for being here and uh, have a great rest of your night. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for listening to The Uptick, brought to you by the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, empowering you to stretch the boundaries to live your best life. The NJ Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, NJCTS, its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented on this podcast. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any guest, nor do we advocate any treatment.